morning. This is Stan in Gainesville, Florida, and you are listening to Light Talk. Hi, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas, and today we are speaking with another great designer on Light Talk. And this is Anne in beautiful San Clemente, California, joining my brothers once again on Light Talk. And this is David in Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk. And we are the Lumen Brothers, sister and guests. <laughs> genders of Light. That's what we should call ourselves, Genders of Light. Ooh, fancy. Genders uh, of ooh. Light. Okay, anyways, I just want to say welcome to episode 115. And I'm telling you, season three of Light Talk has started off with a bang. We've had two great interviews already with Zach Bovray and Don Chang. But we have a whole bunch of great interviews coming up this season, including Ken Billington, Herrick Goldman, Steve Terry, and Tom Littrell. So keep listening and check out our Light Talk webpage, and you'll see all of our interviews coming up. But today, in our trademarked Legends of Lighting series, we have a special <laughs> surprise guest for all our listeners in Light Talk land. And our wonderful Lumen sister, Anne McMills, will introduce our very, very special guest today. Well, it should be legends of lighting and projection, right? <laughs> no, but projection is sort of lighting. That's true. It is yeah. light. Yes, yes. That's how I got into it, right? <laughs> Well, today I'm really happy because we have one of my personal dearest friends, Elaine McCarthy on Light Talk. Um, she and I go way back. So welcome, Elaine. We're so happy to have you here. Thanks very much. Happy to be here. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Elaine. She's a, uh, wow, quite, quite a bio here. Let's see how I do. Um, so Elaine J. McCarthy's background in photography, film, and architecture has led to a global career as an award-winning projection designer for live performance, including theater, dance, concerts, and opera. Her work has graced the stages of uh, the Metropolitan, the Kirov, New York City, and Dallas Opera Companies, among many others. Over the past two decades, she has collaborated on seven world premiere operas by renowned composers Tan Dunn, Jake Heggie, Jennifer Higdon, and Joby Talbot. Elaine's Broadway credits include A Little Show Called Wicked, you might have heard of, <laughs> Man of La Mancha, Thurgood, the Tony Award-winning productions of Into the Woods, Monty Python's Spamalot, and Assassins, as well as many other hit shows. Her recent work on Anna DeVere Smith's Notes from the Field, an exploration of this country's school-to-prison pipeline plaguing minority communities, was nominated for the Lucille Lortel Drama Desk, Ernie, and Henry Hughes Design Awards. The 2018-19 theater season saw her working on three new off-Broadway collaborations, all focusing on the lives of women, Gloria, A Life, About Alice, and Accidentally Brave. So, Elaine, thank you so much for being here. Yay! Hi, Elaine. My pleasure. Yay. Hi. Hey, Elaine. Welcome. Thanks. Yeah, Elaine and I have gone, ah, man, we, I think I worked for you straight for like two, two and a half years or uh -huh. something of my career. Yeah. Um, we traveled the world together. We I know. did mostly <laughs> Wicked and Spamalot were the two that I was on with you, but mm -hmm. it was an incredible journey. You know, you took this little tiny lighting designer and turned her into knowing something about projections design. And that was quite, quite a thing for me and, and really exciting with all the work that we got to do. Well, I was thinking about that just in kind of pondering and uh, uh, pontificating lately, just realizing that you came into my life at a pivotal time professionally because of two reasons. Is One, you were the first lighting design associate that I hired, mm -hmm. and that was a seismic shift for me <laughs> professionally. And uh, as you said, I was I had just become a mom. Uh, mm -hmm. And so those two major changes uh, were wonderful positive changes in my life but you were the first person I remember working with photoshop artists and animators they're not very good at paperwork you know <laughs> and I looked around in the theater and said oh those lighting design assistants they make really good paperwork <laughs> and you know that and and also the best training for lighting design assistants seems to be um also how to replicate someone else's concept perfectly like that is the lifeblood 
and mm. the paperwork is enjoyable, which is mm-hmm. just amazing to me. And um, <laughs> and that was exactly what I needed. I realized that was the person at my table missing was the person who could organize it all. Because projections is if nothing if not knowing what file version we're dealing with and where something is and. And um, yeah, so you were, fortunately it was you, because you were, you literally wrote the book on it. So (laughs) there you go. Yeah, it was really cool because uh, Elaine and I met on my first off-Broadway show. I was assisting Ken Billington on a show called The Thing About Men. And <laughs> Elaine and I met very briefly in the in the lobby. I don't even, even know if you remember that, Elaine. <laughs> but we basically just said hi. And, you know, I was like, wow, that's Elaine McCarthy, you know, and then moved on. And then it was like another two years later or something. And we were doing, oh, my gosh, was it, what show was it? Good Vibrations, wasn't it? Oh. <laughs> No Am I allowed to say that name? <laughs> She'll not a little say classic that name. called, yeah. The show but McDevitt. That not, will not be named. Yes, and I was assisting McDevitt, and that's where we talked a little more. And that was a rough show, so we all went through a lot. And um, you just turned to me one day and said, how do you want to assist on projection? Or would you like to assist yeah. on projections? And yeah. I thought, well, it's come just to one the dark light, side, right? <laughs> and then you said, do you want to come to London for four months? And I said, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, you, you, what was really great was that um, it made sense at the time because I had both Wicked and Spam a lot uh, going off into the world from their Broadway premieres. And it was all about organization. And, mm-hmm. and also, um, Wicked was unique in that it was the beginning of, um, it was the first media server. And the first, and then they had the moving mirror heads, which were a little mm. short lived, but <laughs> they were being programmed on a moving light console. Yeah. So the, suddenly people were looking in the theater and going, oh, wait, we're not responsible for you projection people usually, but that's a moving light console. That looks familiar to me. So suddenly the electrics, electrics department was much more willing to engage. And mm-hmm. um, so I needed somebody who understood lighting because I, the, lighting is not my training at all Mm -hmm. i've trained in a lot of things but lighting is not one of them and in particular touring wicked uh if you'll recall our focus grids Mm -hmm. and of the being told we can have 12 focus positions with those mirror heads well we hadn't designed the broadway production to have 12 positions we had unlimited positions because we didn't think of touring right. and uh, i still knew enough to the business to not design with that in mind um but yeah we came up with which still today gets used by the crude on um productions of wicked all over the place as our focus grids and uh and make their life a whole lot easier so i'm really proud of that stretch of working together and I am well, too. well i'm also proud of the fact that you you allowed me to be a mom uh at a time i mean i was she was an infant my daughter elizabeth <laughs> yeah. she was she was a tiny tiny baby and here we were in london and you know i remember that first time i came into the theater i forget if it was spam a lot or wicked just a little background gentlemen and that is spam a lot and wicked had the nice kind generous aspect that that they inadvertently were back to back in London. So I had a nine month old baby, eight month old baby at the time. And so I just moved to London with the baby for for 12 weeks. That's convenient. Yeah, I mean, it was very nice of them to plan that that way. (laughs) And, uh, and, you know, they put me up in a flat and, and I said, I have one day off a week and I've got an infant. I'm not cleaning. Get me a cleaning person. And they, they accommodated. So they were, I think they appreciated the fact that yeah, I was this new mom and I was packing up in my entire life and living in a, you know, in London for three months. But it was incredible. But Anne made it so much easier because I remember the first day I showed up at the theater and said, okay, I scoped out. There. There's a ladies room on the third floor and it has a plug where you can plug in and you know, take care of your mom business and it's private no one's gonna go in there and I'm thinking oh my god I didn't even think about that and she said I remember this too because she said I have your back because if I don't nobody else will and she was absolutely right it was like oh. you know especially at that time as a 
as a mom in a business, and particularly in a discipline that's male dominated, I felt like I needed to kind of hide maternity, you know, motherhood, you know, mm-hmm. and, and Anne made it safe to be like, and you know, you came up with a phrase to something like, you know, you know, she stepped away and was like, I would tell you I needed a mommy moment. <laughs> <laughs> and you knew exactly what I was saying. And you were kind of like, I got this. <laughs> yeah, we had like a, like a thing you'd do with your hands. And I'd yeah. be like, all right. And you'd walk away. And I would, you know, if somebody came over, I'd just handle the show. <laughs> yeah, it was an incredible journey. You know, I tell, uh, I tell women about that all the time because I teach young women, a lot of young women. Most of my program is young women. And, um, you know, so many women in, well, I teach in lighting, but in projections too, like are afraid of the world of, of like the professional world of theater because they want to have children and they feel that they have been told that they can't do both, you know, and I always say to them, you know, the story of Elaine McCarthy and how you and I sort of raised your child the first yeah. couple of years. Sure. Yeah. Um, I said, you just need to go to assistant. You need a nanny. You need, you know, there's a lot of things you need, but it can be done. And, um, I think it helps sort of uh, allow women to feel not as threatened by that thought because, you know, children aren't something that I've put into my life plan, but it certainly was um, an exciting thing to help you go through that and very inspiring to watch a woman go through that. And I want to, I hope I say go through that in a way that it wasn't negative. It was hopefully a positive thing. And, you know, I remember like, um, you know, you were about to pop when you interviewed me. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and we were walking up and down the stairs of some theater. I can't remember. We were looking at Spamalot or something. And like all the stagehands were afraid, like, oh, gosh, is she going to fall? Because it was like these <laughs> tiny stairs and stuff like that's how pregnant you were. And then our first show was um, Spamalot in Boston, the tour. Mm-hmm. And we literally had your daughter in the um, little chair thing, like on the butt board of the tech table. Oh, you know? sure. Yeah, yeah, no. She was in the theater right away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because in my tenure, the women I've spoken to, a, you know, a, a generation ahead of me, they actually would never even think to bring their child into uh, a theater. And, you know, it's hypocritical because the men, maybe it's not hypocritical, but it's interesting to note that their husbands who were in the business would bring the children in that I remember them telling me that they specifically felt it sh- it kind of showed a weakness in them that they would bring their children into the theater. And I I was more thinking about my daughter as if I'm going to be away from her all these hours, I want her to know who the enemy is. I want her to know, you know, where's mommy all these hours? And I want her to be able to visualize, oh, mommy's at that tech table and she's got these people <laughs> with her and people are in, the, you know, so she was, you know, she thought monkeys flew because basically <laughs> she grew up with monkeys flying over her head. <laughs> So. Yeah, and I remember even like wearing her in the baby Bjorn like oh, yeah. while I was assisting. Like <laughs> it takes a village. No, and to this day, I mean she's 13, she's not in the Bjorn anymore, but um my I come to realize uh a couple things and that is one, I treat child care at this and in hindsight, I treat child care as I treat freelancers, meaning I'm it makes the most sense when I bring someone on for a gig. I've got a Rolodex of childcare people as well as the Rolodex of Photoshop artists and animators and so forth. And it makes sense that way because then when you're not in the theater, you can kind of prioritize the parenting thing and you're not paying through the nose for childcare 24 seven, 365. And um, also people who work with me, I kind of recognize for better or worse People who work with me are family to me. Um, I, I, you know, they're like my kid brothers, my kid sisters. I, I feel like if you're going to spend that kind of time together, it should be that kind of relationship, which is not the most professional relationship, but it works for me. And so in which case, I feel very comfortable sharing what's going on with my child, with my f- colleagues, and and they know Lizzie and, you know, like, oh, Lizzie's coming by. Great. And I, I feel like I feel very fortunate that a decade, you know, I'm sorry, a generation later than my predecessors, I'm able to bring her in and, you know, make it safe. And it was interesting. There was a New York Times article, I think, last fall where they're 
was a Broadway show that had all women. The entire creative team was women, and they were talking about the you know sort of they they were women of infants too. And it was I thought of you, Anne, because I was thinking, (laughs) been there, done that. (laughs) But I was the only woman. (laughs) Yeah, 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 we did. It was so inspiring, and I will never forget. I tell this story about you all the time. There was one there was one day you were very late. And it was fine. Like, I was handling whatever we needed to handle. But I was like, huh, I wonder where Elaine is, you know. And um, you came in at some point And uh, I said, everything okay? And and you said, yeah, you know, I just I just couldn't leave Lizzie. Like, it was just a hard day to leave her. You know, that kind of thing. And, and you said to me, um, oh, and you said you'd been on the phone with another show at the same time. So it was kind of a hard morning. And they were asking you to do another show. And you said to me, you know what I want on my gravestone? I want it to say... Elaine was a good mother, not oh my God. Elaine took another show. Wow. Oh, jeez. That's fantastic. Oh, jeez. Oh, I think of that all the time, and I tell students that all the time. And I use it in terms of not just another show, but just, like, work-life balance, you know, like how well, profound a, that sentence was. That's the thing. We're talking about women here, but, I mean, when one of the things you get when you leave the hospital and the little go bag, aside from your child, is, you know, you get – you know, you get a bottle of formula, you get this, you get a, you get Parenting Magazine. And Parenting Magazine, I don't know if anybody's noticed, is subtitled A Magazine for Women, or for Moms. And my husband, and you know Randy very well, he immediately was so put off. He's like, wait a minute, what am I, a chopped liver? And he was so offended that Parenting, A Magazine for Moms. Um, I was very fortunate and continue to be fortunate that my husband is into the whole parenting thing and he's an equal parent and if it weren't for him and his ability to you know host play dates and god even multi-girl sleepovers in my absence i would never have been able to do all the traveling i've done or the work i've done and i worked with gloria steinem last fall on a on the show gloria life and i will love one many of things she says but one thing in particular she made the point that until men are kind of freed from their sense of the patriarchy and their role as men, we're never going to have a level playing field. And I, a lot of my former assistants or associates or colleagues that are younger than me are now having children. And I see, I see them prioritizing it. I see it being more along the lines of what Randy and I have followed. And that makes much more sense to me so that it wouldn't be a big deal anymore, for, you know. And yeah, I was a mom going into a room, but there was a plenty of men in the room who were parents too, and they were also making sacrifices. And I'm sure they wanted on their gravestone that they were a good dad. Um, but until both genders are able to find an equal playing field, then it, it, it's not easy for them either. I have a quick question, just to follow up. You were talking about, you know, it's, this is all priorities. What, what is your priority? And I find that working in Europe, that the Europeans are much more family-oriented. They, high, they they seem to have a much higher priority for family. Therefore, they have longer vacations, that sort of thing. Uh, did, you, did you find that also, Elaine? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're civilized and yeah. we're barbarians. <laughs> <laughs> they're mat- they've matured. They, yeah, I mean, young. but we're a young country. We're a young country. Oh, and make excuses you know. for our... No, seriously. <laughs> no, no, they're totally civilized and we're not. Um up absolutely and i think that i think that we are workaholics and i think that's really unfortunate i think that we prioritize our self-worth as being having to do with how many hours we're working and 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 it makes no sense when you think about your your trajectory of life and i'm 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 over 50 now and i spent a good part of the last decade or so with my parents in their final years and life is short, and the fact that we prioritize, you know, logging hours and uh, working long days and sacrificing, making choices based on on long hours and endurance, you know, you, it, that's you get one shot at this, and that just doesn't seem like that's what life is about. I mean, it's part of life, but it's part of life. It's not the be all and the end all. And I think that people in other countries, they benefit from state theater. So they benefit from the fact that their government is behind them. So this is a salaried position. I mean, we're all out there trying to put roof, you know, roof over our head and food on the table. It's not a guaranteed thing ever. 
So, you know, we don't really have a choice. You know, it's a luxury to be able to say, well, I'm going to take a few weeks off and stare at the distant horizon. And when state sometimes we get judged for that, right? (laughs) Oh, completely. Oh, you have time Mm -hmm. off, you weakling. And that we live in a meritocracy. Yeah. And I think I think this society, you know, our society is young. We're still building this country. Those societies have been built. So there's a maturity about priorities. I think. I agree. Yeah, definitely. But I think that's part of what is so amazing about our country is is we are bootstrappers. And it's a country made up of people who came here for opportunity and continues to be a country, we hope, that uh, is for people (laughs) coming for opportunity. And um, I think that makes us unique. And uh, it's a it's a vitality. Oh, completely. Yeah. And a creativity, which the rest of the world, I Mm -hmm. think, you know, uh, absorbs and purchases. And (laughs) that's where a lot of our exports come from is our creativity. Mm hmm. So this might be a good segue into the first question that I have for you, because we do create, we generate new industries because of that vitality and, and creativity. So some people think that projection design is a new industry, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I'm very fortunate that I come from the Wendell K. Harrington School of Design. <laughs> Zach uh, told us about the Wendell yep, School. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's because there was no such thing and it's, I always love the fact when someone says they're studying projection design now. It just makes me so happy because (laughs) there wasn't such a thing. And the closest thing there was to it was working for Wendell. It's very funny to me. I remember being at a a workshop through LDI and I just was a fly on the wall. I was in the back of the room and two young men were sitting next to me and, and the people on stage were talking about projection design and when it started six years ago and <laughs> I was just sitting there biting my tongue and then so. <laughs> until that's a right, right exactly <laughs> and then and then you know we went on a break and these two young men turned and said so, what do you do and i said oh, i'm a projection designer oh really how long you've been doing it and at that point i was like 15 <laughs> years and this was you know half my career ago and they were like what? It's only six years old. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there was there. I think it's definitely kind of in its adolescence now. I think it had a very long infancy and mm-hmm. early childhood, mm-hmm. uh, and now it's reached its adolescence. But I think that had to do with the equipment. I mean, it had a lot to do with the sure. equipment. I mean, right. projections yeah. struggles with the dr- trickle down of of technology. In the, I mean, bear in mind, I started in the. I was, I was on, I was a cusp baby in that I, I, I know how to mount thirty-five millimeter slides and cut Pony film and do all mm. old school analog technologies. But I also was part of the transition into digital technologies. So I think that um, that now that it's it's a much faster time. It used to be that. You know, video appeared in in commercial projects and industrial projects, and eventually we could afford it for theater. Things are happening much differently now, where I feel like producers and general managers are thinking you need to have projections as part of your storytelling in order to be relevant and and contemporary. And, you know, that's great for we projections designers, but, you know, I'm not sure that it's necessarily the best for the storytelling. Definitely. You know, I I did my graduate work in Hawaii, and we studied a lot of Southeast Asian stuff. And I remember being introduced to Wai and Kulit, which I'm sure you remember in Shadow Shadow Puppetry. And I, and you know, it's so evocative, and the the puppets and the translucency, and and we watched these uh, 16 millimeter films of it. And I said to one of my professors, "You know what? We should tell them about color." And there were these things called gels. (laughs) And he said, "No, don't tell them about gels." Let it live the way it yeah. is, right? So it's sort of, you know, it's just interesting. In some places, there's something quaint about the purity, and then there's and then there's something great about pro- progress. Yes, yeah. I mean, there's definitely our, our thinking about projection design and the history of projection design, and just even the history within my, you know, twenty some odd years of doing it. And that is that I remember the days of you had ideas in the theater, and Wendell talks about this. You have ideas in the theater. And you took your notes and then you went back to the studio at midnight after the production meeting and you did your notes, You whether it was, you know, Photoshop into a digital file, whether it was 
you know, uh, uh, creating a piece of artwork that, to go to the 4X camera. Nobody knows what that means anymore. Um, <laughs> but you had all this time and then you send it in even rush costs were two days mm. and you'd go back to the theater and be like okay great yeah we'll have those notes in two days and the sh- time and money that it took to create kind of built had a built-in filter and now that we can uh, you know i tell the story about working on impressionism with jack o'brien and we were doing a series of images of whistler's mother and it was coming up on coffee and we did this, you know, sequence and Jack turned around and he said, Oh, Elaine, wouldn't it be wonderful if she winked at us? And, <laughs> and, and then coffee was called and I turned to my assistant and I just said, you got this? And he said, I got this. And we come back from coffee and we run the queue again and she winks at us. And nice. Jack turns around right. and says, did I just see that? And of course we cut it. You know, it was just a joke. It was me kind of ribbing Jack, but you know, in the wrong hands, that, it could be quite dangerous for storytelling <laughs> that the fact that you don't have to think about it's that it's easy because easy things yeah, easy doesn't always mean good that's right. for sure right. <laughs> yeah mm. elaine this is steve down in dallas let's continue that idea you just said storyteller when did you decide you had to be a storyteller in the arts oh, really late in the game <laughs> i was a very late bloomer <laughs> 28 years old when I met Wendell, but even before that, uh, I really didn't get the theater bug until I was 24. And of all places, it was at the MIT Media Lab with a bunch of MIT geeks doing Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, (laughs) So I came to it very late in the game. But upon reflection, I think my first exposure to doing theater was I, I kid you not in my backyard the neighborhood kids used to get together and put on shows like hey let's do a um, show in the barn I we really would we would spend all day uh writing you know thinking about the what it's going to be what we're going to do and we would create a show and then we'd put the picnic bench benches along in rows and we'd charge a nickel I think to all our parents as our parents came home from work and we would do our show for them so that was kind of my introduction I mean my brother and sister and I used to do that too and this was my introduction to lighting design and about how far I got was one of those three three level bulbs so (laughs) that was running the lights in my living room after dinner was turning it on low medium or high but but yeah we'd we'd put our aprons around us and like like um empire dresses and we'd have um (laughs) uh uh, uh, hot pads on our head as like a hat (laughs) and we would make what we thought were these extremely elaborate choreographed things and one of us had to be the lighting person and we'd turn the lights and my parents would come in with their tea and sit in the living room and humor us and what was really <laughs> interesting was all of our offspring from my generation none of us suggested to them to do theater you know to to make shows whenever we go on a family vacation from a very young age they would start doing it it was like it's in the blood wow it's, you know it's it's instinct yeah <laughs> But there was a lot that happened between, you know, do a show in a barn and 28 years old meeting Wendell Harrington and going, right, this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. How did you meet her? Uh, Lauren Halpern, who's a set designer, was a classmate of mine at NYU Mm -hmm. Tisch School of Design. And uh, she worked with David Gallo, (laughs) Mm -hmm. the set designer. And when I, after I was... Of, I was kind of lost after finishing school, and I said, you know, what am I going to do? I, how do I combine my interest in in theater and computers and architecture and photography? Maybe I need to have 12 different careers, one after the other. And she said, uh, you should meet this woman, Wendell Harrington. And um, I went in and I met her, and it was a total epiphany because wow. this really brought together everything that was me. I mean, I was a kid. I used to hang out in this great secondhand bookstore in Harvard Square um, and look at books, old books. I mean, how do you build a career on old books? Well, projection design, (laughs) you know. So everything then came together. Like I had worked as an architect um, for three years. I had, you know, worked at the Media Lab on computers for three years. Just kind of all these pieces of the quilt that became my journey at that point were still just 
a lot of squares of fabric on the ground and people were talking to me like oh why are you such a renaissance woman who picked something it was very like disdain like it was a negative and then I felt so sort of um proud when suddenly it was like ah all of this was not for nothing this was because I was looking for a needle in a haystack you you know I was completely looking for a needle in a haystack and I was very fortunate that I found it but it took till I was 28 years old so well and I think that background made you incredibly versatile like I I often think about um the the tornado in Wicked Mm. and I wasn't there for the building of it but I remember you telling me that it was like a jar with sequins and things in it and you spun the jar and filmed it and that became the tornado and I was so inspired by that (laughs) how Mm. creative is that right but that's the thing is that is that it's like Foley completely (laughs) what I love about design what I love about what we do for a living is the fact that you know, every design question is a new jigsaw puzzle to put together or detective story to tell where you have to go out in the world and hunt it down. And people say, where do you get your stuff? I'm like, where don't I get it? I mean, (laughs) I shoot it. I generate it. I find old books. I seek out old museums with collections, you know, the Nebraska, you know, some small town in Nebraska that has this great collection of photos. It's like, that's the best part and with Wicked we were struggling we were really struggling because Eugene Lee's set is so tactile and Mm -hmm. three-dimensional and collage like and Susan Hilferty's costumes are the same it's all about tactile and if you're building everything out of ones and zeros digitally you don't have that tactile quality and we kept beating our head against it um, and feeling like coming up short and then the great team I was working with we finally said all right we just we just got to get out of the studio and um, our studio was like a hotel room across the hall from the across the street from the theater and so we went to whole uh, um, Home Depot and I think a Michael's Crafts and just kind of grabbed stuff off the shelf and got like a big pile of wood chips and a garbage can and <laughs> a beaker and glitter and we essentially just played and uh, we cut a hole in the trash can and ran a vacuum in reverse put the wood chips in backed by some a a white sheet from one of our hotel room beds and shot the wood chips being blown around by the vacuum cleaner and that is a layer of uh, the gillikin forest when the tornado the cyclone comes through um and the glitter in a beaker. I think we even used like vegetable oil or something. <laughs> so it was a little more viscous. And that became a layer of the cyclone. So by stepping away from, in a time we certainly could build it digitally, we were saved by doing it the old school way. We just videotaped real life things. And that seemed to provide that that essence that, sometimes a digital technology can can lack you know one thing that i all of us tell our students is to always bring your camera with you and now the cameras are with in phones i mean yeah you know you have like super high definition stuff so how how has that helped you as far as that's you know as far as collecting content honestly it hasn't um (laughs) The only times I've ever had the content um, come in advance of the story was purely magic, meaning I don't collect imagery. I don't, I'm not a photographer. I will say that. I'm not a photographer. I I studied photography, but I don't carry a camera around on my hip. Even though I have a phone, I don't think of it as a camera. Um, And I realized a long time ago, a true photographer has that camera on their hip at all times and they see the world as a series of photographs and I'm not that person. I'm looking for I'm looking for the right images for a show. Um so when I have a piece of work brought to me, you know, a script, I read it and I start ruminating on what that show is, I do have a collection of imagery that informs me. But I'm also immediately like, okay, how do I solve this jigsaw puzzle? How do I solve this mystery? Where are the clues? And everyone, I've at this point, I don't really 
go on a pile of of research I have I really every project is a new opportunity to kind of look out there and say where am I where are my materials coming from or where am I going to generate these materials um, the closest thing I, when you talk about that, the closest thing for me was, um, a number of years ago, I worked a three-legged dog and did this whole eyeliner goat peppers, ghost kind of effect, but it was about Hedy Lamar and George Antiel who basically developed, uh, radar technologies and radar scrambling technologies during world war two. It was a great show, but, why I bring it up is that at the same time we were emptying my grandparents' house in Cambridge of a hundred years worth of stuff, including everything my father ever touched in his childhood because he was the baby of the family, the only boy. But he was a boy during World War II, so he had he had all these great kind of World War II toys and popular mechanics magazines, and and I was emptying it out and helping my parents, and I see this one box, and I just kind of threw all this stuff in it, and I was like, this is a show. This is a show. And then two years later, frequency hopping comes along and I need imagery of, of, of um, submarine silhouettes from World <laughs> War II and I need popular mechanic. It was just like magic. It was kismet. Wow. And that mm. show came out of my grandparents' attic two years <laughs> earlier. Wonderful. So yeah. those kind of things I'm always looking for. I see imagery in the world. Um, and it does include my own photography sometimes where it's like, this is a show. And it can be a scrap of fabric. It can be a photograph. It can be a book. It can be a box of stuff from your grandparents' attic. A group of things will have an essence. And I know I need to hold on to it because someday the show is going to come along. And that's happened to me a number of times. Um, we, my husband and I say we suffer from nostalgia. So <laughs> we, that's theater people, I think, in general. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything has an essence. If you're looking for it. Let me ask you a, a different kind of question. I'm looking at your bio here, and um, impressive is an understatement. Clearly, you're very good at what you do. But we work in an industry that has a lot of competition. Mm. And you haven't done every Broadway show that has <laughs> projection on it. Thank God. But I bet there's some that perhaps you wanted to do and you didn't get because of competition. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, how do you handle competition and does that get under your skin and give you any self-doubt at time? And, and if, it, if it does, what do you do? How do you handle it? Oh, sure. It? It's different now than it was. I kind of feel like my career has had two phases and I'm in the second phase now. I mean, we're talking big phases. It's had phases throughout, but seismic shifts. And that is when I started out, there was, you know, you could count on two hands, the people doing projection design. And we benefited from that. We were the storytellers. We were breaking the ground and kind of um, creating something and the competition was limited. And now it's everywhere and there's thousands of people doing it. And that's exciting to me, but it's also sort of like, whoa, this is a whole different beast. And really early on in my career, I mean, I am not a center stage person. I am much happier backstage. Like I said, I came to theater late. I'm not a look at me, look at me person, which is both positive and negative in a competitive business. But in order to keep myself sane, I decided a long time ago that, or I recognized a long time ago that um, the only thing I had, two things going for me. One is um, no one else is me. So as long as somebody out there wants an Elaine McCarthy design, I'll get work. Uh, and that's, that, I think that's just a self-protective approach to take. Because if I ever really looked at all the talent out there, I'd never get out of bed in the morning. Oh. But that was a way to say, well, you're, you're you, you're unique, your vision is unique, and as long as people recognize that and there's a market for it, I'll work. And secondly, the other thing that was very reassuring to me is that I've always worked. Um, uh, you know, I, my first job, I think I was 12 years old delivering papers. And ever since then, I've always worked. And n only a small percentage of that in my career, quote unquote. Um, and even to this day, I think if tomorrow there's no more work for Elaine J. McCarthy, 
you know, I'll work at Starbucks and get something out of it. I will, I'll, you know, I'll find something to do that I have to show up to every day um, because I like working. You know, I've had, I mean, the the jobs I had, what was it? I've had, I've been a candy striper, a waitress, (laughs) a barista, a salesperson, a stock girl, a a survival specialist at a summer camp, a a substitute teacher in my former high school, which was very enlightening. A drafts person in an architecture firm. I worked at MIT Media Lab, as I said, and that was all before the age of twenty-five. So, you know, and all of those things, I could line each of those up, and I could tell you the things I gained from them, uh, not only about work, but about life and about community. Uh, you know, we, how to how to organize an office, how to deal with other humans, how to fire somebody. You know, all that came from these jobs, you know, from being fired, from, um, you know, organizing someone's office. And that's one thing I think a lot of people don't, they think they have a very narrow view of work. It's like, if I'm not doing this, I'm not working. And I'm thinking, if I'm earning a paycheck, I'm working. (laughs) And no, I've always loved to check with my name on it. I'm very proud of that. It's always, no, yeah, I mean, and I think especially as a woman, it's... Yeah, I'm agreeing with you. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's a really good feeling. Like, look, that's me. Look what I did. I earned that money, and now I'm gonna <laughs> put it in the bank. You're making me all sentimental now. Yay! <laughs> because what what I what I see here, and you have to take this the right way. Okay. What I see now is this gravestone with all this <laughs> stuff on it, and at the top it says, "But really, she was a fantastic mom." Oh. <laughs> that's a big gravestone. <laughs> That's a big gravestone. Speaking of, of money, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it's like to survive as a projection designer? Is it similar to being a lighting designer? Um, obviously, you're oh, in sure. a totally different world. But for beginning, um, you know, for beginning artists who want to get into projection design, how do they do it? How do they survive? What's your recommendation? Well, say yes to everything. And I right. don't think that's just projection design. I think that's mm-hmm. theater in general. Right. Um, and that's certainly how I started and, you know, be, be willing to hump your own projectors and program your own shows. And I think that you don't go into theater, um, expecting to make a, make a good living. You go into theater cause you love it. And if you don't love it, get out as fast <laughs> as possible. Yeah. Right. No, seriously. I mean, yeah. I had, you know, I had two parents, um, as many of us do. Um, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, my dad was, I mean, they were of a generation that, you know, the husband was the breadwinner and, and the wife was the homemaker and my mom worked. So she was ahead of her time. And um, but my dad did the job he had to do that wasn't necessarily his passion because he had four kids and had to put them through college. And that was kind of what was expected of him. And my mom was an educator. She worked with preschool children who were had deaf or down syndrome. And it was about mainstreaming them into the classroom and she loved her work. So she would come home with stories like, Oh, you know, little Jeremy today, he spoke his first words, but, and we'd ask dad, how was your day? And he'd say, fine. And it was always fine. And I remember just at a very young age kind of thinking, I want that. I want to be excited and not, you know, and, and and so I think that's why it took 28 years was I was looking for something that would make me come home at night and be like, yeah, and then this and then, you know, but that same person, my mom taught me that every, every career is, you know, a lot of days is just a job and you There's nuggets of, you know, and I always think of what I do is 90% the grunt work and 10% the really fun stuff. (laughs) And, you know, maybe that's really self-abusive of me. And, but, uh, I just feel like, you know, it's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of, um, putting estimates together. It's a lot of finding content. It's a grunt work, but then you get to, after doing that 90%, you get to sit down and make stuff and, to me, that 10% makes the 90%, 90% worth it. But I mean, that was kind of came from came to me from my mom was, you know, it's not as if it's always sunshine and lollipops. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, it's it's really for anyone who wants to be an artist. It's a very sort of general thing, you really have to love it. Um, 
you know, I always break it down to my students the very first day. I, you know, I did a show in Europe and I think I made a, a very large design fee, but when I broke it down by the hour, <laughs> yeah, you, no, you, make, you never you, do that. You, never make, do that. <laughs> you make more at, at in and out and you get health insurance oh. at in and out yeah. too, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. But that's what we all go through, isn't it? I mean, you know, if you wanted to just make cash, there's a numerous amount of things, innumerable things we could do, but the bonus is that passion. I think that theater can give you that opportunity. So Elaine, what type of education do you need to become a projection designer? I was fortunate in that I learned from Wendell Harrington. It, you know, I had my, and, and innumerable other people because my life has been, if nothing else, my life has been um, a series of stepping stones. And those stepping stones were people who steered me in the right direction or gave me the tools um, and uh, uh, now I'm kind of on the latter half of that and I feel as though it's my place now to you know ponder and pontificate uh, you know is to be that person who is the stepping stone for the young people now coming up and I feel extremely excited about that and proud of it and I feel like the there's about a dozen people who've kind of come through the Elaine McCarthy, brought, you know, uh, yes, school yeah. of design, including Anne, and mm -hmm. I feel extremely proud of them and that they're out there working and doing the work. And I'm excited by the fact that for a very long time, I would hire people. I mean, to this day, you know, I, originally I needed to hire people and teach them what to do because they're they didn't come into it knowing how to do projection design. But I was always looking for smart, hardworking, you know, creative, resourceful, respectful people who were pleasant to be in a room with, you know, for 16 hours straight. And I think that continues to this day. And I think young people need to understand that within our business. And that is that is that you can learn all the tools, but being somebody who who is able to be a team player at that tech table for the long hours goes a really long way. And I think that's important to say. Absolutely. I mean, you definitely changed my life, you know, just learning about projections from ground up. And I don't know, I do not call myself a projections designer at all, but I have, even if I've done two Broadway shows that people are always confused by, but, um, you know, the, the amount I learned with you from that, you know, helps me as an educator today. Cause we do teach projection design at my program. I'm not the professor of that, but I can at least, um, you know, contribute in meaningful ways because I was around you in those two shows for a couple of years and it really helped shape who I was. So yeah, you know, opening that to young people, I think is really important. And I was one of those people that knew nothing at the beginning. <laughs> I probably well, still I think, nothing. <laughs> well, as far as education for projections, I think that's, is a really unique challenge because, um, a long time ago working on Wicked out of town, uh, in San Francisco, I had dinner with Susan Hilferty, who I have a great deal of respect for, for, her work at NYU Tisch School of the Arts and the Graduate School of Design. And I was saying, I want to teach projection design. And she said, I don't know that there's a place in, she probably doesn't remember this, but she said, I don't know that there's a place in teaching theater design for projection design. And I know that Peter Negrini now teaches in her program. But at first I was really taken aback and kind of got my nose out of joint. But through the years since then, I've come to realize what she means. And that is projections in order to be a projection designer the set of skills you need um doesn't cleanly fit into a theater program i mean it's mm. good to have exposure to filmmaking it's mm. good to have exposure to photography and the history of photography and semiotics so that you're understanding the import of the imagery you're creating and um, I mean, I had a lot of media studies. I had a lot of, you know, women in the media, that kind of thing. You know, bear in mind when I was growing up. So, you know, in the 70s and 80s, this was kind of what was being discussed. And I think those all are fundamental to image making. But having been in a traditional theater program, you also need to know theater history. And you need to be, you know, you, as a projection designer, you need to design scenery you know you need you need to design lighting the things that we all have to do when we study in a traditional program so what gets me excited is the fact that you know I got very it's been very difficult thinking of curriculum because I mean at this point some in this point in my life 
teaching makes sense. Mm. But what gets me excited is young people who are in their early 20s now and then young people, you know, my daughter's age in their teens, because what's nice is they're teaching them. My daughter was, you know, and sleepovers in kindergarten, she and her friends were shooting movies in our backyard and <laughs> editing them and wow. putting soundtracks to them. And it was sort of like, geez, you know, and their their comfort level with that. And the people in their late teens, early 20s, you know, they they were teaching themselves after effects in fifth grade. Mm-hmm. So the tools are no longer front and center because that's what turns me off to educating projection designers is, is the idea of teaching tools because tools are constantly changing and you know whether you take that paintbrush or this paintbrush out of your toolkit isn't the most interesting thing my hope is that the storytelling comes back to the forefront and the and the history so that the education of projection design can be along the lines more of 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 theater in which okay, you've got your tools, now exercise these tools and learn this history. And I do think projections needs to be a hybrid of more photography, filmmaking, slash theater um, in order to really work in the long term. But hopefully universities will think more cross-disciplinary, I think, as time moves on. And as these young people grow up who are like, wait, what do you mean I can only study X, Y, and Z? I want to study the whole alphabet. (laughs) Well, Elaine, thank you so much for being here. I mean, you and I could talk forever, so we got to do yeah. dinner again soon. <laughs> <laughs> but I have enjoyed the Elaine J. McCarthy hour, so uh, thanks for sharing all your thoughts me with too, our Me too, me too. <laughs> legends of Lighting continues, thanks. Legends of Lighting, the That's circle right. of legends. Well, that Hammond organ solo in the background tells us that once again you spent another morning listening to Light Talk. Be sure to follow us on our Facebook group and subscribe to our podcast. You can find us on any of your favorite podcast providers. And be sure to subscribe to Light Talk. That way you won't miss one second of crazy lumen insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. And just remember, if you choose to litigate, our law firm, the new guys and gals at Fleck, Flock, Flair, and Glare, and their paralegal snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers and Sister, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, San Clemente, and the Lone Star State. And be sure to tune in next week when we talk about lighting different skin tones, fixing the broken stuff, and the death of the park hand. All that and a new sponsor, Light Talk. We are broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. We'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Thanks, Elaine. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, Great guys. show. Light Talk.